welcome to Autodesk HQ in Sydney here. Uh, it's good to have you guys here. Yeah, we get to be in a nice quiet environment where nobody can walk in front of the camera or interrupt. <laughs> yeah. We can actually talk about the VR, the nice, calm, yeah. simple, civilized, but still so exciting. Yeah. Which is good. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I would ask you first, what tools and skills mm. do people need to get into VR? That's um, it can be super simplified, because <laughs> I'm sure that there's plenty that you can no, spend it's hours a talking really about. Good, but, yeah. Really good question. And I think, you know, it's one of those questions, uh, how long is a piece of string? Mm -hmm. um, so the first, the first um, way to answer that question is actually to ask a question, because if you're making a VR experience, what sort of VR experience are you making? Are you making one from the point cloud, like the example we've got here? Um, or are you making one from digital assets, like the other example I'll show you a little bit later? Um, so if you're using point clouds, then your pipeline's going to be quite a bit different than if you're using just normal uh, digital data data sets like yeah. uh, like um, you know 3D models like you would say making a game environment and that sort of stuff. So I guess you know let's let's use the um, the point cloud example. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing you want to do is you want to take your point cloud. So whether it's using a um, uh, a machine that actually does all the point cloud capturing, mm -hmm. or whether you're using photos, um, it kind of under the hood does the same thing. Yeah. So you've got all that data. Um, the next thing is you need to turn all of either the point clouds or photos into geometry. So we've got um, a couple of tools that are really good for that. First one uh, is the, the newest one that we've got called Remake. Mm -hmm. So Remake comes from Memento. So we've had Memento out for about two or three years now. Um, and we, we've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, uh, we've rebranded it from Memento to Remake. And, one, and it, it's fantastic for um, not only turning point clouds into Geo, but actually editing that Geo as well. Um, and I can, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that a little bit later. Um, so once you've done that, then you know you want to bring it into something like 3D Studio Max or Maya um, to finesse, do whatever you need to do with it there, uh, and then from there you export it out into a game engine. So Autodesk has Stingray, that's a game engine we bought maybe, I don't know, three years ago, four years ago now. It used to be called BitSquid, uh, and um, when we bought it, we brought it in-house, uh, we spent about a year developing it and then released it as Stingray. Uh, so once you've got it into Stingray, then the great thing with Stingray is you've, you've actually got um, preset export options for um, different consoles, so for iOS, for Android, oh. for PlayStation, um, Xbox, uh, and VR yeah. as well. So it's ridiculously simple. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Sometimes. So that's so that's yeah. it. So if you're you if so if you're using Point Cloud, that's your pipeline. Uh, if you're just using normal um, uh, 3D assets, then mm -hmm. it's actually simpler, right? Because you don't have to do any of that Point Cloud stuff. You just yeah. start with Max or 3 Studio Max or Maya, and you just make your models from there. Yeah, that is cool. And so, when would somebody go for the Point Cloud? Point cloud route, and when would somebody go for the three D route? If they're just starting out and they just they want to make something, how do they know if they should do the point cloud stuff or if they should just go straight to three D? Um, I I think um, where I'm seeing the point cloud sort of part of this happen more mm. is more in the civil industry, so architecture, um, uh, road building, design, yeah. that sort of stuff, manufacturing. That, those guys they they want to understand. The, the actual space, yep. and they really needed to be accurate, right down to like you know, the, the smallest microns Makes sort sense. of thing, yes. right? Don't get that wrong. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that's where I'm seeing that side of it being more. They're more interested in the, in the point clouds. If you're just making a game, if you're just trying to play with it, um, experiment with it, get your head around it, skip all that. You don't need to worry about yeah. that at this stage. Just start making models. Um, and I'm assuming that your your um, audience already has some sort of 3D background. They're so, very well made. Yeah. So um, you know, if you've already got a 3D background, and you know you know your way around 3D piece of software. Then you know half your half your work's done for you. Really. Yeah. 
That's it, yeah. Good so, and I, I love it, so we'll just put it through here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was going to my next question, right. <laughs> yeah. which is, so, everybody who may already have 3D experience, mm. even if it's like a tiny little bit, like some people have tinkered with it in the past, they made like one or two 3D images because it was fun, it's like a little experiment. Mm. Um, but even for people who know tons about 3D, there is still a bit of, I guess, a different approach when you're wanting to put something into VR. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you really quickly, if you are going to sum up, what are the key differences that people need to keep in mind if they already know how to do 3D, but they want to get into VR and put their stuff that they've already created into VR? Yeah. Look, I think to a, to a large degree, there isn't that much more difference to it. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> and that's a big but to this, yep. right? So there's not that much more difference. You've got to, you know, nor normally getting your assets into a game engine, whatever game engine it is, you're using some sort of FBX mm -hmm. um, export, whether whether you've got some direct link. And that's one of the great things with Max and Maya is we actually have the send to button, which sends, so it does what, what we call a live link. So mm -hmm. it'll send your, your data sets through to um, your game engine. Yeah. Under the hood, it's still using FBX, right? So yep. that's really what's, what's driving all that. That part of it's not really that much different. There, there are certain um, uh, texture sizes and resolutions you need to think about because of the, you know, the, the, the requirements of VR. But the biggest thing I would say that you need to be aware of is more of your environment. What are you going to do with your environment? Do you want your audience to stand still? Or do you want them to walk around? If you want them to walk around, how big is that space? Are you so the the Vive here that you can see? We've got it pretty much maxed out at about five by five meter box. Yeah. Uh, and that's what um, HTC say is the maximum distance you can get. Mm -hmm. And I've really tried to push that. And I have to say, five meters is pretty much it. You can't yeah. really do. Okay. You start to lose tracking and syncing issues. I'm jealous. You have enough room to do it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> five meters. It's pretty good. It's, it, I must admit, it is pretty good. Um, so if you've got an environment and it's no bigger than five meters, then great, you can have your, your audience walk around that five meter space. Yeah. But I'd, I'd um, question whether anyone would ever build a uh, VR experience that's only five mm -hmm. meters. So that, you know, let's just say your, your VR experience is 10 meters by 10 meters. So you've, you've you know, made your space so much bigger than the actual physical space you've got. So you need to put in what's called a teleporting uh, prompt, basically. So a teleporting prompt is just a, a like a cue. Um, so you can press on it, and it'll allow you to teleport to the next thing. Yeah. So there, there's several ways you can do this. You can either have, um, let's just say we've got the space like this, and you want to go from point A to point B. Point A has a teleporting. Q, point B has a teleporting cue. You press on yep. point B and it sends you there. Yep. The other way you can do it is you can have more of a, um, a sandbox sort of teleporting zone. Mm -hmm. So you can use a controller that sort of throws out like a, like a little fishing line. Yep. Throws out a fishing line and it'll say, I want to teleport to there and you can see and pick where you want to teleport. Yep. So that's a good way as well. But um, the, the problems with that that I've seen is that uh, when you use a fishing line um, process, it, it tends to, the learning curve for people tends to be higher. So yep. people that aren't used to it get lost really quickly. When you're using the point-to-point -point teleporting, that seems to be um, an easier thing for people to get their heads out. Yep. That said, you know, I've demoed, and, and there's one that I'll show you, the San Francisco, and I've demoed this so many times at so many different shows. And I still have to talk so many people through that <laughs> process. Yeah. So um, there's still a learning curve, right? But um, with some of the other ones where you're using the fishing lines or teleporting, uh, I've seen people just get hopelessly lost, and just yeah. they just don't. I think the biggest problem is they don't uh, understand, um, like conceptually understand what's going on, and yeah. that's why they get really lost. The other thing too that I would say. And this is something everyone in the VR space is really struggling with right now, is trying to um, uh, control that narrative or have a narrative in the VR space. Um, and I've seen this with many, many people playing the VR stuff that we've got, that they'll miss massive cues. You can have oh, yes. a video, you can have a, a visual cue, an audio cue. You can even have, 
you know, lines and, and neon signs pointing, yeah. do this, and people will literally sort of look around and go, oh, what's going on? Yeah. Um, well, actually, and that's the other issue that I've seen is, and I think the audience, our the modern audience is so used to having their entertainment in front of them yes. that when they're in a VR world, they're in basically a 360 world. But I've seen so many people that will stand there and just look like yes. this. And then you say, look around, and they go, oh, isn't that amazing? Wow. <laughs> and like, you could, you yeah. know, so they won't even look around, yeah. let alone walk around. Yeah. It is, it's still such early days that there's still a lot of the, I guess, the gap between, well, we are used to it because we're building mm -hmm. VR, we're techie people, but a lot of mainstream society still aren't as aware of yeah. the whole idea of what VR really is. And say some of them might have even just used a Gear VR or Google Cardboard, and even then they're used to just kind of, oh yeah, that is cool. Yeah, that's it. And in a lot of the Google Cardboard and Gear VR examples and stuff that people made, mm. most of the important stuff was still always there. It was yeah. kind of like, it's really cool, there are things around you and stuff, but the main stuff is always still yeah. forward. So I think there is still that yeah. one step forward. Soon, maybe that's society it. will kind of understand more yeah. if they've done a few VR experiences and they'll look around, but for now, yeah, it's got to work and we're just going around that. No, that's it. And, and the other thing too is the, um, you know, one of the things I love about the HTC Vive is the physical space that you've got. Uh, but you can see the space I've got here. I don't think many people at home have the luxury of this sort yeah. of space. I mean, I don't have this space at my home. I am happy um, to lie to my Vive. I trace over my bed and <laughs> I can actually yeah. walk there when really I can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did that as well at home. And then I was playing um, one, of the, one of the games and I went to throw something. And actually smashed my hand into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, that that's going to be a very frequent occurrence. I think, it is, yeah, for yeah, a while. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I, and I think that's something else that you know we're going to, as developers, struggle with or have to come to terms with is that physical space over mm. the virtual space and how we're going to deal with that. Yeah, that's cool. And I think the key question is, how did your controller survive being in the wall? Well, fortunately. For the controller, it was my arm that actually hit the wall. Cool, and your arm was fine. <laughs> oh, I had a massive bruise from it. <laughs> so yeah. I, went, I, went, I was in. I was fully committed to that. <laughs> wow, what game was it? Yeah. I can't even remember now. Your <laughs> mind is just traumatized. Yeah, no yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Do you have any tips for people who want to get into it from a non-technical kind of background? Mm. People who don't know how to code, or anything like yeah. that, but they still want to get involved in VR. How can they do that? Yeah, I mean, I would say one of the one of the things to look at is audio. That's a big one that seems to get overlooked a lot. Um, and you know, I've met some amazingly talented um, uh, composers, uh, audio directors, musicians. Uh, look at that space. You know, yep. if, if you're if you're that way inclined um, musically, definitely look at VR. The there's there's so much need for really yep. good uh, audio, music, sound effects, all of that. Um, UI design is, is another interesting thing and this is something, again because you're in a 360 space, uh, we're still writing the rule book yes. on what, what is a good UI and what isn't a good UI. Um, so you don't need to be a 3D person to, to do that. Um, in fact, it, it really good 2D skills I think and okay. really good really good understanding of, of say colour and colour palettes and, and shape and form, okay, I think cool. a, a, a really, you know, I'm seeing a lot of UI design that seems to be designed by techie people, yes. and it just is terrible yes, because it's it designed is. by techie Somebody people, Somebody needs right? to step in and help. Absolutely. So so there's that, um, where I, I see there's a massive need right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as the, the content goes, um, you know, you when you're starting to talk about 3D characters and 3D worlds, the skill set from being a game designer or being working in the games industry, um, if you're already a modeler or an animator, uh, a, a environment designer, any of that sort of stuff, it's not that much of a difference. You're still making 3D characters, you're still using mocap if you're doing mocap, hanky animation, hanky animation. You're still having to do all the usual things of modeling, UVing, rigging, all that sort yep. of stuff, right? So that, that hasn't changed. Um, but, but that hasn't changed. But um, like I said earlier, trying to work out a narrative in that space, that has completely changed, that completely yeah. changed. Um, and I would say no one really 
million nodes how to make that work right now. Yeah. There's oh, a lot right. of people that are that are sort of saying, oh, you should do it this way, or you should do it that way. Um, but everyone's still kind of working it out. So, yeah. so if if you don't need to be technical at all, um, and I mean this is just me spitballing here, but I kind of have a feeling that um, if you understand plays, how to put, how to control a play with in, in that um, stage sort of environment, then maybe those people are going to be more inclined or, or more adept at designing. Uh, the, the VR experience yeah. because they're agree. used to not having that cinematic sort of um, with the cinematic tools of cuts or close-ups or yeah. you know all of that sort of stuff which we rely on so much in, in the film industry and in, in the game industry yeah. as well um, so maybe I don't know yeah. I don't know I'm just like I said still to be working it out yeah. <laughs> like yeah. everyone else cool yeah. and then to finish up how can people get involved um, with Autodesk products where do they go and what should they start with if they're kind of just getting started with what, what's the first thing they should download, I guess? If they're like, I don't know what to do, yeah. how do they do what do I do? Wow. Um, well, okay, if you're a student, then you have access to all the Autodesk suite. It's, it's free for students. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to worry about trying to, to buy it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's good is um, we've, we've gone through this process of changing our, our pricing model. Mm -hmm. So there's now uh, basically a monthly option, so you can you can rent it basically for a month if you're curious. What you know, what is it? What does it do? And you know, that, that can bring the cost down. And, and again, the, the cost depend and vary on different geos. Yeah. But you know, a cost of one seat of Maya, uh, you know, used to be five to eight thousand dollars. I think you can rent it now for one hundred and seventy dollars a, a month. That's cheaper. You know, so it's a it's a lot. It's a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, to answer that question, my first question to that person would be, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to create the content? Do you want to do the UI design? Do you want to actually do some coding? Yeah. If you want to create the content, then the first place you really need to look at is either 3D Studio Max or Maya. That's mm -hmm. that they're really the staples of creating um, uh, 3D content. Models or all of that sort of stuff, animation and all that. Um, if you're looking at doing coding and actually building the worlds and doing that stuff, then Stingray, that's a game engine yeah. that we've got. Um, and then after that, there is hundreds of bits of software. One bit of software I've really been getting into this year is Fusion, mm -hmm. uh, Fusion 360. So that's, uh, that's a really good, that's fantastic for um, doing like product design. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been really getting into, you know, like designing up like figurines, miniatures, that oh, cool. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but you can do even more cool things where you can actually do product designs for, say, a lamp or a new type of uh, chair, yeah. stuff, you know, stuff like that. So it's really, really amazing. Uh, and then what's great with Fusion, for instance, is you can, can set it up for a 3D print as well. Mm -hmm. So it sets up your bedding for the optimized um, positioning of that object for 3D printing, oh, cool. depending on what printer you're using yeah. as well. Um, so yeah, uh, and I mean we haven't even touched on software like Revit and, and you know all these civil industry bits of software. Yeah, which so. you can then bring something to them too. Absolutely. So people in those industries will likely already be using them, so it's just more important that they know that they can Absolutely. That into yeah. VR. Or if you know somebody who uses Revit and things like that, yeah. that you can be like, hey, I can take your stuff in and use it in VR. And Absolutely, kind of yeah. Get some cross sharing. Yeah. That is cool. Excellent. Well, thank you. No, it's my pleasure.